Strachey's alleged 1965 proof. This is how it goes once again. Suppose t of r is a Boolean function taking a routine or program r with no formal or free variables as its argument. And that for all r, t of r is true if r terminates, if run, and that t of r is false if r does not terminate. Consider the routine p defined as follows, recursive routine p, label l, if t of p go to l, return to the label. The analysis is as follows, if t of p is true, the routine p will loop, and it will only terminate if t of p is false. Strachey concludes, in each case t of p has exactly the wrong value, this is the diagonal argument, and this contradiction shows that the function t cannot exist. That's just on one slide, if you like, Strachey's complete argument with, with regard to a CPL language, the combined programming language. Just to be clear, it, it, it was inspired by the ALGO language and it was a uh, predecessor to the C programming language. And what Strachey did was provide a CPL code fragment. CPL programs could be compiled and executed as the following comment indicates. I equate program with program capable of being run. This comes from H.G. Epsimon in 1965 who replied, who was one of the people who replied to Strachey's 1965 letter. They were asking the question what precisely is a program, what precisely is an impossible program. To generalize or to, to summarize, there were three kinds of reaction to Strachey's 65 letter appearing in volume 8, issues 1, 3 and 4 of the computer journal. The first kind of reaction is mostly historical. Some readers complained about the concept of proof by contradiction. They were accustomed to it in domains such as geometry, but it was unorthodox to come across this kind of reasoning in computer programming. A second remark is that, strictly speaking, Strachey's proof was wrong for the following reason. T should be taken to be a computable Boolean function, not just a Boolean function. Strachey's conclusion should have been that T is not computable, as opposed to saying that T is not a function, because T most definitely is a function. See the exchange between Strachey and App Simon if you want to have more details on this second comment. The essence today is the third point. It's about mathematics versus engineering. And again, I am on the one hand I can refer to a reply from Maurer to Strachey's letter, where he says Strachey's letter was of particular interest to me because I had, several months ago, proved that it is indeed possible to write such a program that can solve the halting problem. I'll say more about this later, but on the one hand, this reply by Moore shows that this third point is historically relevant. It's about modeling, if I would use my own terminology. On the other hand, I'm going to put on my engineering hat and elaborate on this third point, stepping away a little bit from the purely historical context. So improving Strachey's proof, this is my assessment, using my modern day computer science hat and my engineering hat, I would distinguish between syntax and semantics. And if you look at Strachey's proof, he conflates the two. I would distinguish between R in syntax and our model in semantics, being a, our model is a mathematical object while R is a purely syntactic object, I would distinguish between T program and T and then we have this 
recursive routine P which I would slightly rewrite as I do now on the blackboard with T program of P instead of T of P in my syntax. So mathematically, semantically we have computable partial functions on the natural numbers and they should not be conflated with the syntax with the syntax expressed in the program text. We can define a relation implements and another relation models. T models T program T program implements the function T. We say that B implements A if and only if A models B. That's my definition. I'm trying to clarify to actually improve, slightly improve Strachey's alleged proof by separating the syntax from the semantics by explicitly talking about implementing on the one hand and modeling on the other hand. And so here's my analysis. Suppose T of R model is a computable Boolean function taking R model as its argument. And suppose that for all CPL routines R, we have number one, that T of R model is true if CPL routine R terminates if run, and number two, T of R model is false if CPL routine R does not terminate if run. Now, suppose that a CPL program T prog exists which implements function T. Consider the following CPL routine P represented textually as follows. Precisely what I've already written, recursive routine P and so on and so forth. This is my analysis. Note below that T program has to be faithful enough to T for the proof to carry through. I.e. the model fidelity has to be good enough if not perfect. Which is something that Strachey did not consider at all. Consider now my analysis. If T of P model is true then assuming a good enough model fidelity, T program of P evaluates to true at runtime. So then CPL routine P will loop, assuming a good enough model fidelity, this means that T of P model is false. Now you can do the same analysis by changing true to false, true to false, false to true, and then the will loop to will terminate. So you have two cases, the one I just showed you in white and now the red one is the second case. Both cases give us our desired contradiction. So in each case we have a contradiction, so at least one of our assumptions does not hold. Strachey only had one assumption, the first one that I'm going to write down, write down. He didn't have the second or third assumption. So I'm correcting Strachey's proof and we'll see where we end. Our assumptions include, number one, computable Boolean function t exists, not just Boolean function t exists, but computable Boolean function t exists. Number two, which Strachey did not have, t program and p and so on constitute valid CPL programs. For example, they have to be compilable. Number three, the model fidelity is good enough. Strachey didn't have a third assumption either. Strachey only took assumption one into consideration in 1965. But who says that two and especially three hold?
Concerning the third assumption, a computable partial function is an idealization of a program executing on a physical machine. This is the Kopitz principle, which I already introduced in the beginning of this lecture. So now there's a philosophical intermezzo, now that I've given a refined exposition of Strachey's argument, some critical readers will insist that assumption 2 is a fact and not an assumption. Once one assumes that Strachey's T of R is a CPL routine, it follows that Strachey's P is a valid CPL program. So according to these critical readers, the only possible reading of Strachey's expression suppose T of R is a Boolean function is the following. Suppose T of R is any CPL routine computing a Boolean function. If I then claim that Strachey did not seem to be aware of the need to specify that T has to be a computable Boolean function. My critical readers will insist that Strachey did not need to do so because T is computable by the very fact that it is supposed to be a program. Now my rebuttal. I disagree. There is a categorical difference between a computable function on the one hand and a textual representation of that function on the other hand. The textual representation serves as a prescription for a physical computation on a real computer. The critical reader is actually, if you think about it, he or she is actually interpreting the word program as a mathematical object for how else can T be both a function and a program, while the same word, the word program, frequently refers to a compilable CPL program. This perfect ambiguity of the word program is precisely the core of my entire critique and is, by the way, reminiscent of Parnas's remarks which I quoted earlier. So I have critical readers making the conflations that I'm precisely protesting about. It's time for Conclusions and a Q&A session. Conclusions. The relation between basic computability theory, computer science, computing practice, is something that is always taken for granted, in academic circles at least. At the very least, I have shown with a simple but paradigmatic example that this relation is subtle and could have several distinct and not necessarily consistent interpretations. The 
To be more precise, I have provided a critical reading of a short letter by Christopher Strachey to the Computer Journal, 1965, which presents a proof of the unsolvability of a halting problem, an alleged proof. The letter uses the nowadays usual diagonal technique. Formulating it into a real programming language, Strachey's own CPL language, and thus arguing that there are no programs in CPL that solve the halting problem. That statement I will return to. My critique is that Strachey, in his exposition, mixed the layer of the actual program which will be compiled and run on physical machinery and the layer of the mathematical model of a program. By doing this, by conflating, that statement is a non sequitur from the alleged proof. One needs an additional hypothesis of fidelity, model fidelity, with regard to the actual programs, the ones that consume energy and take up space. Something that Strachey never observed and even less cared to formulate if you would actually study the exchanges between Strachey and his respondents you might come to a similar conclusion. Like in many papers in programming language theory, when an author says this program does that, it is always tacitly assumed that the utterance means this program when executed on an abstract machine with unlimited memory, unbounded time, true unbounded integer arithmetic, and perfect fidelity, perfect fidelity for at least conditional and while statements does that. In itself, it is a harmless way of simplifying an exposition provided both the speaker and the listener agree on the convention. I have argued that this is not always the case. So, my conclusions Based on what I just said, let me now delve into two subsections, separation of concerns and a historical interpretation. The separation of concerns. My analysis suggests that a good dissemination strategy regarding undecidability and its practical relevance should comply more with Martin Davis's 1958 or 1994 expositions, rather than with Strachey's 1965 letter. The crux is to remain solely in the mathematical realm of computable partial functions or Turing machines when explaining undecidability to students and fellow colleagues. A mathematical object, such as a function, cannot be executed. Nor, by the way, can a function terminate, as you will find in many computer science papers. A separate concern, then, is to discuss and debate how that mathematical impossibility result could 
by means of a Turing complete modeling language have bearing on the engineered energy consuming artifacts that are being modeled. Historical interpretation. My educated guess is that in 1965, not to mention today, almost every engineer would have preferred not to model unbounded memory computations when perusing the computational limits of programming technology. No-nonsense engineers, they work with finite abstractions, hardly ever with infinite abstractions, if at all. The engineer would explain that she would preferably resort to finite state machines or perhaps linear bounded automata, which is based on another kind of abstraction, finite state machines instead of computable partial functions. However, even then the model fidelity is far from perfect. A computer, after all, is not a finite state machine. It can only be modeled as such. That's again the Kopitz principle, which I am alluding to. Dijkstra, in the 1970s, or Dave Parnas himself for that matter, and some other people, advocated finite state machine or finite abstractions, and then you have somebody like Strachey and many other people who advocated infinite abstractions. Two questions. Why did Strachey rely on this infinite abstraction, on this infinite memory, in his analysis of computation? Why did Strachey present his alleged proof in the first place? So, number one, it allowed Strachey in his programming language research to proceed from the simplest mathematical case, at least what was the simplest for him and many fellow mathematicians, which is infinite memory, to the more complex man-made constraints of intrinsically finite artifacts. I am paraphrasing. Mr. Waite, specifically from page 216 in my Turing Tales book, published in 2016. The second question. Intellectual pleasantry is my answer. That's why Strachey presented his impossible program. And based on Strachey's personal writings, I don't think he would disagree. I'm referring to the archives, the Bodleian Library in Oxford, which I visited in 2013. In sum, Strachey's 1965 letter needs drastic rewriting before it can be disseminated as a proof to fellow computer scientists today, at least the ones that are willing to take all of this objectively. As a university lecturer, I have been asked to teach Strachey's proof as such, that is, to fuse real systems and mathematical models of computation. Since I originally come from engineering, I am very sensitive to the kind of complaints, for example, that Dave Parnas has made and many others. So, my outline I've presented four sections, now it's time for a Q&A session. Questions and answers. First, is it just Strachey's 1965 letter or is it more common in computer science? This question comes from somebody outside of computer science and I will say something about this. The second question, you mentioned Maurer's 1965 response to Strachey. Can you elaborate? Yes, I can elaborate and I will do so.
I'm going to present the work of Hopcroft, Motwani and Ullmann to show, based on a 2007 textbook, that Strachey's alleged proof is far more common than some people might presume. I will discuss two sections in their book, Turing Machines and Computers and Turing Machines and Computer Programs. A second way to answer the first question is that I will present a typical discussion between a prominent computer scientist and myself. This is published in the last chapter of my Turing Tales book. I will present it here again. And then the second question, can I elaborate on Moore's response? Yes, I will present Moore's full account in a moment. Moore's approach was based on finite abstractions, not unlike Dijkstra or Parnas. I'll start with number one, a typical discussion between a prominent computer scientist and myself. Hopefully conveying the general flavor of the kind of reasoning going on in computer science today. So Mr. X, this prominent computer scientist, tells me I can't find a proof that the EDVAC machine or some other machine of the 1940s, 1950s, I can't find a proof that the EDVAC machine was string universal. Can you give me an article in which this claim is proved? If not, I will have to look up the, the, the machine specifications myself and I will have to prove Turing universality myself. And then I reply in my email, proving that the EDVAC was Turing universal is not possible mathematically. Just like some students think that their smartphone is Turing complete, I'm saying that that's a category mistake. Just like it is impossible to prove that my laptop or my smartphone is equivalent to a universal Turing machine. I continue and say I can model my laptop or my smartphone. I can model any physical device as a Turing machine or as a finite state machine or as something else like a linear bounded automaton in each case I will have abstracted away several details from my device. I continue. If I choose a finite state machine model for the EDVAC, then I can argue, or for the laptop, then I can argue that my laptop is not as powerful as a universal Turing machine if I model my laptop as a universal Turing machine then I can view my laptop as Turing universal it's all just a plain modeling exercise this seems to be such a simple message that is very difficult to convey Mr. X says, I'm not sure I agree. It should be rather easy to prove Turing universality of a given computing machine, M. I say, one can prove that two models of computation are equivalent or inequivalent. However, you cannot prove that a mathematical model is equivalent to a physical machine M. Again, that's the conflation which I am protesting about. Mr. X says, but all you need to do is program a universal Turing machine in the physical machine M. In doing so, you may assume that M's memory capacity is unbounded. Proving Turing universality is no big deal.
I say you have to make an assumption about M's memory capacity you could just as well have taken the opposite assumption in your, and I emphasize, modeling to show that M is not Turing Universal. Mr. X says, if I'm not allowed to make that assumption, then not a single machine, not a single physical machine is Turing Universal. So the assumption seems necessary because the assumption is so simple it seems to be the right assumption to make. That's quite something. I say assuming that machine M has a bounded memory, not to mention a constant memory, is also simple. That's the end of the discussion. My philosophy students understand that from day one. Computer science students have real difficulty grasping the conflation that I'm complaining about. Now number two, Hopcroft, Motwani and Ullmann, they make exactly the same kind of conflation. Similar to straight chain 65 and similar to Mr. X, whom I just discussed. Turing machines and computers. Turing machines are mathematical objects. Computers are engineered artifacts. So mathematical objects mathematically model or can serve as a mathematical model of engineered artifacts and engineered artifacts or computers implement Turing machines. Or, so a computer can be viewed as being an engineered model or an implementation of a Turing machine. Hopcroft et al seem to agree with all of the above because there's nothing controversial about what I just said. However, in their chapter 8, Hopcroft et al. also attempt to mathematically prove or demonstrate or argue, albeit informally, that a computer can simulate a Turing machine and that a Turing machine can simulate a computer. And this is standard textbook material, you'll find it in almost every computer science textbook. All this in order to come to what I consider to be a dubious claim in computer science. Thus, we can be confident, and I'm quoting Hopcroft et al., we can be confident that something not doable by a Turing machine cannot be done by a real computer. Page 372 in the textbook of Hopcroft et al. So I question all of this. How can a Turing machine, just like a prime number, do something in the way that a real computer does something? In my opinion, this is again a conflation to make sense. And I'm not even a philosopher, but apparently I'm rather philosophically inclined for many computer scientists. To make sense of this claim, we need to be explicit about our modeling activities which is basically Dave Parnas's message in a slightly adjacent research domain. Specifically, we should distinguish between two persons, an engineer who models, i.e. who implements the Turing machine, if you like, with a real computer, and secondly, a scientist who 
mathematically models part of the real world. In this case, mathematically models the real computer with a Turing machine. And this distinction between the engineer who uses models in one way and the scientist who uses models in the other way is explained in Edward Lee's book Plato and the Nerd from 2017. This is again standard stuff. So coming back to Hopcroft et al. and their chapter 8 Simulating a Turing machine with a computer is easy provided that we are allowed, I'm quoting them, provided that we are allowed to accept that there is a potentially infinite supply of a removable storage device, such as a disk. The authors note that this argument is questionable since the physical res resources to make disks are not infinite. So according to them the real world is finite. Subsequently the authors ask us, the readers, to be realistic in practice with regard to their mathematical argument so that their simulation carries through. That's all fine with me, but then we are stepping away from a purely mathematical argument. That is, simulation acquires an engineering connotation. That's simulating a Turing machine with a computer. Now let's look at the other relation and that's simulation of a computer with a Turing machine. To do this in polynomial time the authors, Hopcroft et al, now introduce a finiteness constraint. Specifically they now do put a limit on the number of bits that one computer word can hold in order for their proof or their argument to work out. To be clear, I'm not saying that there's any contradiction here, but the choices made by Hopcroft et al are clearly modeling choices. They're actually more engineers than they would be willing to admit so that their overall argument works out in the first place. I will explain this in more detail in the coming minutes. In sum, Hopcroft et al. are actually mathematically proving an equivalence between the following two very similar mathematical models. This is what they're actually doing. They have a Turing machine on the one hand, no question about that, and then they have a carefully crafted digital abstraction of a real computer on the other hand. So that too is a mathematical model. The authors are thus definitely not backing up their following two claims. One, a computer can simulate a Turing machine and two, a Turing machine can simulate a computer when computer is meant to be the physical object. More correct would be the following. One, a computer can model, can implement a Turing machine, can serve as an implementation of a Turing machine, and a Turing machine can serve as a mathematical model of a computer. And that's the way an engineer would put it. That's the correct way to put it. But it's not as profound, of course, as what computer scientists would, prefer, would, would like to have. 
Thus the authors incorrectly draw the following conclusion. I'm quoting them. Thus we can be confident that something not doable by a Turing machine cannot be done by a real computer. The previous statement only holds if the authors have demonstrated an isomorphism between Turing machines on the one hand and real physical computers on the other hand. But again, they have not done so. The isomorphism they consider only holds between Turing machines and their carefully crafted abstraction of a real computer, of real computers. So basically they're saying real computers are Turing universal because we say they are. That's what it all boils down to. As an intermezzo I'm referring to this book by Ivar Peterson. This is an intermezzo and I'm actually just brainstorming now. We have the planets, the solar system, the whole history of how the laws of Newton helped a lot in predicting even the existence of planets that were unknown. And then on the other hand we have the computing machine, which is also physical, modeled with Turing machines. So I'm wondering now whether we can make some kind of analogy and whether the analogy breaks at some point. In fact, I'm not too happy with those words up there, so let me erase them. Instead of laws of Newton, I write deterministic clockwork. And so then we definitely have a similarity with the two arrows going up. And my main message today is that there's an imperfect model fidelity. A Turing machine does not fully capture a computing machine and deterministic clockwork mathematically does not fully capture the real mechanics in the physical world. But then there's a second message and that's about deterministic chaos and unpredictability. The laws of Newton actually have a lot of unpredictability to it, something that's only known since the 1960s or 70s. And to that extent the Turing machine is very similar to the laws of Newton. We have the halting problem and unpredictability there as well. So two messages are conveyed on this slide. The one, the main one is the imperfect model fidelity that you also will have, I mean physicists will agree at least today that the laws of Newton have an imperfect model fidelity with regard to physical reality. The second remark which I just presented as an intermezzo is the deterministic chaos that you have in Newtonian mechanics and you could actually make an analogy with the halting problem and Turing machines. But that's the end of my intermezzo and if that confused you, so be it, forget it. Here's the second subsection of Hopcroft and et al where they now talk about Turing machines and computer programs. The authors want to equate Turing machines to computer programs. I would insist on the other hand that we have Turing machines, linear bounded automata, finite state machines and so on and so forth. They can all serve as models of a physical computer running a computer program. So I would not equate the Turing machine model with a physical computer. I would just view it as a possible model of a physical computer. The authors say it is undecidable whether a program prints hello world, whether it halts, whether it calls a particular function, rings the console bell. Page 413. The notion of undecidable and the notion of Turing machines is mathematical in nature while ringing the console bell or printing hello world is physical in nature. The distinction has to be kept in mind. We do not want to conflate the two. We do not want to equate Turing machines to causal 
activities such as ringing the console bell due to the execution of an energy consuming computer program. However, every now and then Hopcraft et al. fortunately do seem to be aware that computer programs are not Turing machines after all. Because they write the following. Programs are sufficiently like Turing machines that the above observations are unsurprising. So that is in retrospect unfortunate again that they make this conflation. It's sufficiently like Turing machines. Hop furthermore, Hopcroft et al. are aware that computer programs can also be perceived as finite automata, finite state machines, which is a good thing, but unfortunately again, they consider a finite state machine to be a poor choice by default. And they write, Turing, treating computers as finite automata is unproductive. This is plain wrong if you look at model checking in industry today by far the technique used the most in both software and hardware industries and model checking is precisely based on finite automata on finite abstractions of real computing technology not on infinite abstractions not on the Turing machine type of abstractions the authors stick to the Turing machine model and motivate their choice their preference by stipulating that computer memory can always be extended in practice. And I quote, if we run out of memory, the program can print a request for a human to dismount its disk, store it and replace it by an empty disk. So to champion the Turing machine model, Hopcroft et al. have now decided to model a composite system that is a real computer plus a human who has to interact with the system. No nonsense engineers, by contrast, will stick to the original problem, the original system, and instead rely on a more realistic model of computation such as the finite state machine model or the LBA model linear bounded automaton but if we do that we don't have the halting problem of Turing machines in our picture anymore and that's of course not something theoretically theoretically inclined people like Hopcroft, Motwani and Ullmann would want to have So, now I can present the third part, Ward Douglas Moore's 1965 reply to Strachey, where he advocates finite abstractions. And I'm quoting him. Sir, I have just come across Strachey's letter on the impossibility of writing a program which can examine any other program and tell in every case whether it will terminate or get into a closed loop when it is run. The latter was of particular interest to me because I have several months ago proved that it is indeed possible to write such a program. At least in the case of finite memory, I emphasize finite, it may be of interest to compare my approach with Strachey's and Professor Turing's to observe why the results are not in fact contradictory and that's because it's all a modeling exercise if you ask me it's all just 
modeling. So there are no contradictions and there's no universal truth about something that is impossible. Continuing, Mora writes, a computer with finite memory has a finite number of states b to the power m where b is the number of values which each memory element can take to in the case of a binary computer and m is the number of memory elements let us say that a routine terminates if and only if it comes to an instruction which transfers to itself i.e. does not change the state of a computer then a program terminates if and only if the computer eventually reaches a state such that it is the same as the next state. This is all common knowledge for computer scientists. It's just a different way to model. Unfortunately, many computer scientists don't cast the whole exercise in terms of modeling and that's the point I'm making in the present day lecture. Continuing, Mora writes, specifically let M be the memory of a computer which is a finite set including all registers and the location counter. Let B be the set of values which each memory element can take. So B is contains the entries 0 or 1 for a binary computer. Let S be the set of all maps from M to B, that is all states or instantaneous descriptions, to use other terminology, of the computer and let I map S to S, so let I be the map which determines for each state of the computer including the value in the location counter of course determines the next state of a computer I'm still quoting more a program is now a particular state S of a computer to determine whether the program S terminates one simply calculates I of S I of I of S until a power I of small i plus small j of s if until that is found which is equal to i of small i of s the program s terminates if and only if j equals 1 the various states i k of s may be kept in a finite memory m prime which is disjoint from m the process will always terminate since s is finite and each i k of s has a finite representation the memory m prime may likewise be taken as finite thus the theorem is proved and then he continues in his last paragraph it is interesting to note that Strachey's disproof does not seem to involve memory. It is applicable to programs running in finite memory and itself uses a finite procedure which does not use recursion 
or push down storage. Continuing, the difficulty seems to be that what was actually proved above is the following. Given any program in a finite memory M, there exists a program in a finite memory M prime whose cardinality depends on that of M, which will determine whether the original program terminates or not. Strachey's arguments do not contradict this fact. If Strachey's program P is embedded in M and his T of R which determines whether R and in particular P terminates or not is embedded in M prime then P calls T so that P is in fact embedded in M union M prime and thus the conditions of a statement are violated. In general M prime must be much larger than M. Sincerely yours, W. D. Morer. So I'm still discussing the Q&A session. Here's another question that I got. What is not clear to me is if the author, that is me, if the author considers that this misappropriation of undecidability of the halting problem is problematic only from a methodological point of view or if it can have major consequences on the actual construction of software tools? That's a fair question coming from an anonymous referee. My answer is as follows, both. And I emphasize the can in that last sentence of the reviewer. And I agree, I have hardly addressed the second concern raised by the reviewer. My methodological clarification, which is the core of my contribution, will hopefully contribute to education. So the education of future generations of computer scientists and software engineers. This, all comes, this question comes from reviewer 2. And Reviewer 2 also provided more feedback. Reviewer 2 described the Turing machine model as the most general possible. He, that's what he did in his review of my work. But I question in my work the justification of precisely this claim. To rebut So to rebut, I can point in the literature to, number one, a more powerful model of computation and argue that its model fidelity is at least as good as that of the Turing machine. And in future work I will argue that pioneers in distributed computing were, without knowing themselves, endorsing 
or embracing a more powerful model of computation than the Turing machine model of computation. And number two, I can point to a less powerful model of computation and argue that its model fidelity is far better than that of a Turing machine. I'm referring to Carl Petrie's work, which I will discuss in future lectures. So there are various ways to convey the non-universal aspect of the Turing machine model of computation. Review 2 also wrote the following. According to my interpretation, the author considers that if one reasons on executable computer programs rather than on mathematical programs, then maybe the negative solution to the halting problem for actual program termination can be avoided. My reply is as follows. One never reasons on engineered artifacts, that is, physical objects, directly, contrary to what Review 2 seems to suggest. So Maurer, for example, worked on a finite abstraction, just like Dijkstra, Knut, Parnas and so on advocate finite abstractions. Maurer did not work on technological artifacts, but on finite abstractions thereof.